I want to introduce now Dr. Liam Engel, who is an illicit drug researcher seeking to empower psychoactive ecologies and the people who use them. Liam works with Edith Cowan University, the University of Queensland and RMIT here in Victoria and is passionate about the conservation and cultivation of rare ethnobotanical plants. I welcome now to the EGA web stream, Liam. Um, and this one from Jake, should I bring my San Pedro in out of the rain during uh, heavy rain periods? Um, well, I guess it depends because like I said in the video, ideally you put your San Pedro on the ground so it will get as big as possible, as fast as possible. But obviously we can't always do that and maybe unfortunately it will have to be in a pot. Uh, and then I guess the answer to that question it depends on the specific plant. Some San Pedro can handle a lot more water than others. So uh, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to just uh, make an assumption. Um, so really my suggestion will be keep an eye out for it. If it's showing any signs of rot or just discoloration or, or something that makes you concerned that maybe it's getting too much rain and move it inside. If there is anything like rot or whatever, you will need to cut that out. Uh, and maybe... Uh, another kind of potential way of dealing with this would just be increasing repotting it and increasing the kind of amount of drainage in the soil mix because that's going to be helping a cactus handle um, more water because it'll, it'll drain faster. Um, a question from Bob, and I don't know if his tongue is in his cheek here. Um, you might be able to clarify, Liam. Uh, is it safe to eat the fruit before going to work? I, well... I think, I think it is uh, probably safe uh, in terms of whether or not there's mescaline content in the fruit. I'm not exactly sure. I uh, don't know of many people that are or have, have heard of many people that have eaten the fruit with that intention, but I've definitely read reports online that people uh, consider there to be some mescaline content in the fruits. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, Judging by the kind of the potency of the cactus itself, my assumption would be if it did contain mescaline, it probably, uh, if it was at a similar kind of concentration per weight as it is for uh, the rest of the cactus, you'd still need to eat a lot of fruit. And, you know, uh, I don't know, I, I, I'm conflicted. The fruit is delicious, but I also want the seeds. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. If you can get high off the fruit uh, and you're in a situation where that was legal, uh, well, I, I guess you've got a tough decision on your hands. Um, a question from San Pedro, who wants to know what conditions are required for San Pedro to flower. San Pedro feeling some deep internal issues about itself here. Uh, well, ultimately, I think it is a little bit mysterious. Uh, it, it relies on a whole bunch of factors and knowing exactly how those factors all interrelate is not exactly clear. Uh, there seems to be a correlation with plants that are stressed flowering, and I think that has something to do with a plant anticipating that, you know, maybe I'm going to die, I better try to reproduce. Uh, and uh, two tricks I know that you could do if you were really trying to get a flower out of a plant, uh, one would be to graft a bit of it, because uh, grafted plants often flower at a, at a, at a kind of earlier age. And uh, the second would be to put it in a, in a pot. Often it seems root-bound plants are more likely to, to flower. Uh, and maybe that has something to do with the stress as well. And again, like I don't have any excellent evidence to rely on, but it also seems maybe terracotta pots, root-bound uh, San Pedro in a terracotta pot rather than a plastic pot, maybe that will flower even quicker. So if you're desperate for flowers, maybe that's how you could go about it. Uh, question from Dr. Stephen Bright again, um, asking if the uh, current bubble that's going on uh, is uh, why there are there is such an interest in clone names. Uh, well, I think clone names uh, for someone that is new to cactus, it's a really easy way of identifying one. You maybe you're not so confident on your own ability to judge what a plan is or how you appreciate it just from your eye. And so when there's a name and then especially when that name gets attached to a, a perceived high value because of this auction group kind of thing, uh, people perceive that name as having the value. Uh, so I think there's definitely um, a kind of financial power at play that is making people get a bit more obsessed with clone names. 
Uh, and yeah, it's it's uh, I'm ultimately conflicted about it because uh, names are fun and names are interesting, uh, but at the same time, I'm not always convinced people are using names to tell people something about a plan or to, to inform people. I think often the name maybe it gets caught up in this financial interest or or some other you know some other interest, but. Uh, ultimately it makes it more confusing for everyone if you're not naming a plan to communicate information because, uh, you know, I, then I have to learn what your agenda was behind the plan uh, as well as just trying to, like, categorise it in my own, you know, mind taxonomy list thing. Uh, a question from E.N., uh, what is the best fertiliser to use to encourage San Pedro growth, if any at all? I'm not sure, and I think to say that one's the best uh, it gets is even more complicated. I often like to, you know, use materials that I already have, both to keep the cost down and to try to use kind of local stuff. Uh, like I reckon a really simple kind of leave and forget cactus mix is, is 50-50 organic material and drainage material, and that organic material could just be your compost. Um, and, and you could get away without fertilizing that. And I'm, I'm sure the, the plant will kick on pretty well. And I know a lot of people swear by, um, a product called go-go juice. I don't want to plug it too hard because, you know, a lot of stuff works. Um, I've had a lot of success with worm casting tea, uh, but really, uh, use what you have available and it isn't going to cost you a lot of money. Uh, and, and, you know, ideally is good for the environment as well. So if you've got a compost heap, um, yeah, use that. You don't. I don't think it's that important to buy. You know, fancy additives. Good soil do the job. Uh, any recommendations? Uh, Yellow submarine looking for recommendations on literature, books uh, on uh, growing and cultivating. Um, well, I said them in the video, but I'll say them again. I, I really think the three core texts are um, Trout's book, uh, which is oh. I can't remember the exact title, but it's like Trichocereus and Related Hybrids or, or something like that. Um, and that's at his website, troutsnode.com. You can get a PDF of that for free. And there is also two other books that are a bit more recent, written by Patrick Knoll, and that's uh, the San Pedro Group and San Pedro Hybrids. Unfortunately, they're not available online, um, but you can get a lot of the information from uh, Pat's website, trichocereus.net. Uh, ben is interested in which insects uh, in Australia, other than bees, pollinate San Pedro. Oh, gosh. I wish that I knew, and I don't. I hope someone smarter than me can help. Uh, yeah, I have no idea. Anything that flies around and gets into sweet, sweet pollen, I guess. Uh how how uh, this is a, a, a another question uh, that I have here. Um, how can people help with um, peyote conservation? Yeah, well, this is really tricky and something I uh, want to know more about myself. Uh, what I, I do know is that kind of the the leading figure on this is the Cactus Conservation Institute, and two people I know that are doing a lot of heavy lifting both in that organization and just in general, a keeper trout who I mentioned before and a guy named Martin Terry. Uh, and I, I've kind of tried to consume like all conservation related parody literature and materials related to this to try to figure out, you know, what the hell can I do with someone living in Australia that is, isn't just giving money to the Cactus Conservation Institute, which for sure is, is worthwhile. Uh, and my first thing that I did, I, I made like a, a peyote library online um, just in the idea of, you know, spreading awareness of this plan has to be uh, something that we can do. So even just telling people about this conservation issue, I think is a good start, discouraging things like wild harvest. Uh, and uh, I, I kind of think slash hope there might be even more kind of interesting and involved future maybe where uh, people could get involved in, in replanting efforts in places where the peyote has kind of been extinct or where, where it's threatened. Um, but it's, it's really hard because you need to get the right seeds to grow the right plants so you're not introducing the wrong plants and kind of affecting the species should they breed or whatever. But then this creates the risk of 
how are you going to get those seeds not from a wild population? Because if the population is threatened and then someone's going in there to get the seeds, that's an unnecessary risk. We definitely don't want to encourage people to kind of create a market for this threatened seed that is wild harvested. It does seem like there might be some European collections and, and other people in general that are cultivating some of these plants from these threatened areas. So, yeah, I think... You know, in a dream world, we all get organised and we say, "Hey, this area is, uh, you know, needs uh, is under threat. This area is under threat. This guy has mother plants from that population. Um, we mass produce those seeds. Get everyone mass producing those seeds, and you know, somehow we get them planted back in the ground." I think you know it's pretty hard on international scale. There's a lot of weed importing laws, and the further away from the population it is, and the more kind of people that are involved, the more chance there is of there being. Uh, a plant that, you know, maybe something got wrong or got mixed up or, or whatever. Um, but these repopulation efforts are happening and the Cactus Conservation Institute and a bunch of people are, are doing them, making, you know, giant green hot greenhouses growing heaps of these plants with the long-term goal of replanting them. Uh, so, yeah, that's something that is being done. I'm not sure how as people in Australia and as community members we can contribute, but I reckon... If we show enough interest and we keep, you know, just being like, hey, here, trap, what can I do for you? Uh, maybe maybe we'll figure it out eventually. We just need to get more organised. Uh, Jacob's uh, wondering if San Pedro are able to self-pollinate or if they have a mechanism that prevents self-pollination. Uh, I think there are a lot that do self-pollinate uh, and then there are some that don't. It, it depends. Um, and there's another question. A lot of these questions, there is a, a very vibrant conversation in the uh, Q&A. So a lot of these questions are getting some answers uh, in the comments section as well. Uh, but I'll put this one to you, Liam, and um, we're just about um, out of out of uh, questions then. Um, but uh, how do you prevent uh, insects and bugs that like to eat cacti from eating cacti? What are your suggestions well, my first strategy towards that was just to grow so many that I would be the bugs because of the quantity. Um, but, you know, you can use different insecticides. You can use kind of uh, more natural alternatives uh, as a kind of preventative mechanism. Uh, one thing that seems to be great for a very common problem uh, is neem oil for scale. If you uh, mix neem uh, with water, spray it on your plant at night, uh, use that to scrape the scale off with a toothbrush in the morning and then rinse that off before the sun comes up because if the sun goes on the neem, it can burn the plant. Uh, you know, that's a, a, a good treatment for, for scale and I think that can be used as a treatment for a bunch of other nasties, but it is going to be specific dependent on what pest you're dealing with or what issue you're dealing with. Uh, and there's a, there's a, there is a cool Facebook uh, group about that and a, a cool person who's actually not on the SAB forum um, but he's on Facebook uh, and her name is GB. She's from the US. I don't know much about her, but damn, she knows a lot about uh, trichoserious problems and her group is called Trichoserious Disease and Virology. So if I have something weird going on, that's that's where I'll post my, my question. Now I'm going to third or fourth um, the suggestion in the comments, chickens, backyard chickens, love to eat most pests as well and they don't seem to be too bothered they'll by destroy the your landscaping they'll destroy your landscaping oh that had chickens they destroy they my beautiful rocks they just everything yeah they are definitely um agents of mm. chaos but they will eat uh your bugs um or and um actually on that note as well um pigeons are not good um i had a peyote um and i don't know if my my pigeon um just I got some kind of peyote problem going on, but I had to move the uh, peyote plant, uh, the cactus, to a, to another room because uh, she was trying to eat it. So chickens, yes. Pigeons, Delicious. no. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> San Pedro. Sorry, I'm just looking over here at the comment section. San Pedro, no one going to mention boofing? No, we're not. Um, you can try it at home. Um, remember to remove the spines first, depending on, um, you know, what... Uh, what your flavour is, I guess, um, but it is going to be a painful experience. Um, 
Uh, and I think that's pretty much it for questions, unless there's anybody else uh, who has some questions they want to drop in the next uh, moment or so. Um, just finally, um, one for you, Liam. Where can people get their hands on San Pedro um, if they want to? I feel like we might have covered that question already, but just as a, as a final, if somebody's thinking, oh, I want to go out and get some San Pedro. Sure. Well, uh I, I always want to plug the Shaman Astralis Nursery. They normally have something going and they, uh, you know, Torsten, the guy who runs it, is really knowledgeable and has lots of cool stuff and it's great to support him. Um, another kind of common vendor that's good to support is, is Herbalistics. Uh, but really, I think the coolest way to do it is to stalk people's Facebook photos and send them a message. Uh, I think part of the joy and awesome uh, thing about Cactus is the community and when you buy from a business, you're less likely to get invited around to come and check out their plants. And when you go and check out someone's plants, uh, that's always the, you know, way, way more fun than just getting in a box. So, you know, maybe, maybe people won't invite you around the first time. They might be scared. You might steal their plants. Um, but really, I think the best way to get it is to find out who's growing it and send, send them a message. Uh, a final question from Kane. He did ask this one earlier and I missed it. Sorry about that, Kane. Uh, but on mutant creation, um, su- uh, slug and snail slime, does it help to create mutants? I'm not sure. I, I, I haven't heard of people, people using that and with success. If it does, awesome. And it sounds like, you know, there could be, some advantage to that because I know some of the things people are applying to try to produce mutants are kind of some weird and wacky chemicals that people are a little bit concerned about. And I imagine people are going to be less concerned about uh, escargo slime. Uh, it kind of sounds kind of classy when you put it like that. So, yeah, cool. If it works, tell me. I'll um, start making some snail jam. Thank you very much, Liam, and thank you for your wonderful video presentation tonight. Um, will you be around in the comment section for the uh, ongoing conversation there for a bit longer as well? Sure. I will linger to chat about Cactus forever. <laughs>